Washington, the Washington Theological Consortium. Uh, we are a community of 10 graduate theological schools in various Christian traditions with uh, Jewish and uh, Muslim uh, studies partners. And we would like to welcome you along with our two other uh, hosts, sponsors of this event. I want to thank the Mid-Atlantic Cooperative Baptist Fellowship for their support and encouragement around this particular event and its relevance to the church today. And we want to give thanks to the Institute for Justice Formation at the John Leland Center for Theological Studies for actually uh, conceiving of this series uh, along with the um, MACBF. And we are glad at the consortium to be hosts with this. Uh, at this joint effort. We are in a time of re reckoning, my friends, around many issues of justice, including systemic racism. And the question for us in the next few weeks will be, to what degree is critical race theory as a framework for understanding critical um, issues in systemic racism? To what extent is it helpful to the church and to educational institutions and others? We will be uh, dealing with um, experts in this field who have worked with critical race theory or issues of systemic racism uh, for many years in their own education, teaching, and ministries. Now I'd like to um, remind you that we will all remain mute, muted during this session this morning, um, we in, except when the speakers are presenting. Uh, they will be unmuted, and we invite you to share your questions, however, at any point during presentations and dialogue uh, between the speakers. Share your questions via the chat uh, feature, which is, should be at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. If you have any questions about how to use the chat, um, just email the Watch the Ocon um, address uh, in, uh, well, um, you can you can actually just put I think a, a, a finger up or something, but the chat feature is fairly uh, explainable once you click on it at the bottom of your of your screen. Um, we want to give thanks to Yvonne McKinney with the consortium for hosting us on Zoom today and keeping us on schedule. Now I'd like to introduce the president of the John Leland Center for Theological Studies, Dr. William Smith. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for putting together the conference along with the Institute for Justice Formation and uh, Mid-Atlantic CBF. Uh, the John Leland Center for Theological Studies is an accredited seminary, a member of the Washington Theological Consortium. We're, we have a, a rich student body, uh, rich in diversity. Our school student body is majority minority. 
and we have more than 50% of our students as women students. The faculty is international. We have professors, core professors from Ghana, Estonia, Korea, Argentina, Russia. So students find just going from one class to the other a change in perspective on the world. It is an enriching environment and I'm grateful to be part of it. Leland, about a year, two and a half years ago, uh, joined in partnership with the Institute for Justice Formation to offer an academic uh, graduate certificate in biblical justice. And I'm thankful for the Reverend Sam Feimster, who's an alumnus of Leland and certainly one well able to lead us in this area of reflection and academics. And it has enriched the seminary's life already, and we're grateful uh, for this program. Most of our students are, almost all of our students, are bivocation and volunteer ministers. Leland's schedule accommodates this unique uh, student body, so all our classes are at night, and we have 82% placement of students in ministry because many of them are already serving as ministers before they uh, even come to seminary. Because we are in the Baptist tradition, we have that kind of flexibility. We're a free church, but we are within the ecumenical orthodoxy that goes back to the very beginning of Christian life. So, Grateful to be part of what's happening at Leland with the graduate certificate under the leadership of uh, Reverend Feimster. It's only one part of the Institute for Justice Formation. It's broader and deeper in its ministry than the academics, but we are pleased and proud to be part of uh, the Institute for Justice Formation and in particular this graduate certificate. So I'm glad all of you are here to participate and have an experience that I think will enrich all of us as we reflect on justice, uh, in particular justice, not only in our society, but in particular in our churches and among our church leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. I'd like now to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, the first uh, presenter will be uh, Dr. Henry Allen. Um, Dr. Allen often likes to go by Hank, and uh, Hank will lead us through uh, an, inter an introduction to critical race theory. He has been a sociologist for four decades, teaching at many institutions from Bethel College and Calvin College to University of Rochester um, and uh, Wheaton College most recently. Uh, he's taught courses in a variety of areas of sociology and done research in a variety of areas from sociology of education and, and science and urban life, also exploring issues of violence in minority communities, violence against women, the sociology of hate. He's done research in uh, police shootings, race and ethnic relations, um, and uh, many other areas. He has a PhD and an MA from the University of Chicago. He's a Danforth Foundation Baccalaureate Fellow and uh, Dr. Allen, Allen uh, has consulted with a variety of organizations, including the National Education Association, American Bible Society, the FBI Academy, and the African American Leadership Roundtable. He's done international um, presentations and been part of seminars uh, around the world as a member of the International Sociological Association, and he received the Albert Nelson Lifetime Achievement Award from Marquis Who's Who in 2018. He is widely published in uh, the field of sociology. Um, he is very um, devoted to um, issues that are lively in uh, Christian churches and is here today to help us explore uh, the intersections of uh, sociological research and critical race theory and uh, our joint work together in ministry, ministries of uh, justice and of reconciliation. Uh, responding to uh, Dr. Allen today will be uh, Dr. Jeff Willits. Uh, now, Dr. Willits is senior pastor at the Parkwood Baptist Church in Annandale, Virginia. He uh, has been the uh, dean of the McAfee School of Theology at the uh, Mercer University uh, most recently. 
and was the founding academic dean of the John Leland Center for Theological Studies uh, some years ago. Uh, Jeff has a strong academic background with a BA in philosophy and religion, uh, magna cum laude from Campbell University, a master of arts in religion from Yale University, a PhD in philosophy from the University of Wales and uh, Swansea. And he has uh, uh, long been active in both ministry and in academic studies uh, and uh, theological formation for students. So he brings a great intersection of worlds that will, I think, be helpful to um, all of us today. He served as editor of a number of theological journals, um, and um, he has been active in the Baptist World Alliance, the Society for Philosophy of Religion, American Academy of Religion. Uh, so we will have a response from uh, Jeff uh, after um, Dr. Allen, uh, after Hank has uh, given his presentations. And uh, I just want to, before we move to our uh, speakers, just want to make sure with uh, Yvonne, our, our uh, Zoom host, have we covered all the uh, basics uh, for our Zoom meeting today? Uh, questions in the chat, chat room. So just a reminder, we will take chest, uh, questions in the chat box uh, at the bottom of the uh, screen. And uh, when we're highlighting uh, PowerPoint and a speaker at the same time, there is a, a, a bar in the middle between the um, highlighted shared screen feature and the face of the speaker that you can slide right and left to uh, make the speaker larger or the uh, PowerPoint presentation larger. So now I would like to um, turn the program over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Hank Allen. We're good. All right. Uh, first of all, let me thank everyone who is standing in the gap on this issue today. You know, often in our society, we hear people talk, there's more heat than light. So today we would hopefully bring some light to a controversy that I'm sure all of us have heard on the news about critical race theory, the big boogeyman. And we've entitled this webinar, Critical Race Theory, Friend, Foe, or Opportunity. Now, why should the church, why should any person who believes in the book, why should any follower of Messiah, of Christ, be concerned about this topic in our society at this time? Well, first, we are people of truth. And our mandate as believers is to explore and promote truth, whether it be biblical or special revelation or common revelation. It's our responsibility to pursue the truth because truth always matters. What is it? We're to know in John 17, 3, the one true God uh, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. We also, as he said in that great prayer in John 17, we're to be sanctified, sanctify them by their truth. Thy word is truth. That's true. But also he speaks in common revelation. That's also true. Psalm 100, verse 5, it says, the Lord is good. My pastor, when I became a Christian at age 12, he used to always cite this verse. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Let me say that again. His truth. When he speaks, his truth is to all generations. So we have a mandate as believers to explore the truth wherever it's found. At good old Wheaton College, there used to be a professor that would talk, Art Holmes would talk about all truth is God's truth. So we need to engage any issues that relate to truth. Second, in our society, we have a lot of people that talk loud and say nothing. Those of us who know James Brown, but no, he wrote a song about talking loud and saying nothing. Well, it's our responsibility to expose popular delusions, uh, vain myths, misguided pretensions. Paul told us to cast down vain imaginations that everything that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and to try to hold in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Uh, Timothy, and pa Paul wrote in Timothy in chapter 3, that evil men and seducers, the old King James, 
will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and deceiving themselves. Uh, we're also a, a people of the book. Our, des our desire is to increase empathy. One of the characteristics of a true man or woman of God is that they're peaceable, they're impartial. The uh, peacemakers show in peace. They're shalom makers, if you will. Read James or Yaakov, which is his proper name, 3, 13 through 18. We could also see in the book of Yaakov or James that we're not to show partiality to people based on their outward appearances. Uh, another reason to be engaged in this issue is to expose manipulative leaders and dangerous personalities. Christianity is not just undulating through the tulips. It's not always easy. There are people, leaders, who manipulate the flock, Ezekiel 34. There are leaders, and you know Christ's greatest denunciation was against the religious leaders of his time. If you read Matthew 23, 23, he says, you tithe the mint, the deal, the coming, and yet you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, equity, and mercy. He says, you, you should also have, yes, you tithe, but you should not neglect the weightier matters, the more important matters of the law. So explore truth, expose delusions, increase empathy, Expose manipulative leaders, dangerous personalities. I taught criminology for many years. There are dangerous personalities in our society and in our leadership. Uh, to heal the wounds of history, giving beauty for ashes. I love Luke 4, 18 and 19, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, quoting Isaiah, I believe it's 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to do something. First, to preach good news to the poor, to delivery of, of sight to the blind, set at liberty all who are oppressed, release the captives, proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. And the last thing is to proclaim the gospel. But there are other things that we need to do before proclaiming the gospel, preaching good news to the poor, and so forth. And then to promote biblical justice. Thank God for the Leland. Center, the uh, Institute for Justice Formation, because it's rooted in the truth of Micah 6H, which says, what he has shown thee, O man or O woman, what is the good and what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So there are many others. I don't have time. We, I can fill the whole time with just focusing on biblical presuppositions, but I wanted to throw those out. Because when I hear Christians say that we should not be concerned about race or justice or CRT, I realize that those are immature believers who really don't understand the full dimensions of the kingdom. When we talk about critical race theory, we always have to realize that context matters. Why do these ideas emerge? For me, the image that I have of CRT is a volcano. And beneath the volcano, there are things that are churning and, and eventually there's going to be explosion. That explosion, in my opinion, is CRT. So what are some of the things that we can do to analyze context? If you're in the humanities, you tend to focus on issues related to the basic heuristic, which is a method of discovery. Who, what, where, when, how, so what, under what conditions? Those are the questions that People in the humanities ask over and over and over again. There are others, text criticism, form criticism, and so forth, redaction criticism, all those kinds of issues relate to the humanities. But as a social scientist, as a scholar, I was taught my freshman year of college at Southern Illinois University by a brilliant sociologist, you should also understand the context under which people claim truth or ideas. Is it a scientific context? Is it an analytical context, philosophy, it's, uh, mathematics, excuse me? Is it a documentary context, history, law, literature? Is it a pop culture tech, uh, context, media, commercial media, ads, uh, phenomenon like that? I wish I had time. I don't have time to get into all the strengths and weaknesses of this, but I just want you to show you that there are different ways of analyzing context as, as it relates to CRT. You also have, I've talked for 
30 something years, 38 years. The difference between what is invisible or informal and what's visible or formal. Most people only do the analysis for what they can see. But what we realize as scholars is that what you can't see, what's behind the scenes, usually generates what you see. So as a sociologist, as I look at CRT, I'm looking at what are the individual effects, what are the group effects, the networks, what are the communities, the associations that are involved, what are the organizations, the institutions, what are the subsystems as these things connect together, and what are the systems? So it's much more complex than we have time to go into now, but those are some of the ways. The Allen matrix is something I have used, and I, we'll talk about that next time or the, or the third session about how that can be applied to CRT. Uh, there's also, when you talk about race from a sociological point of view, you can talk about issues of migration. How do these groups come together? You can talk about how do they interact with one another? Do they fight? Are they, are they looking for symbiosis? Is there some kind of negotiation? You can talk about just the, the intergroup conflict or the intragroup with in-group conflict. You can talk about stereotypes, positive, negative, neutral. You can talk about how they fit into institutions like family or education or the economy or the political system or the government. You also can talk about identity. How do they see themselves? Do they see themselves as assimilating into the dominant society? Do they want to maintain their own uniqueness, their own unique community? So those are some of the issues that relate to analyzing context. And the last one is by a very famous, I think American scholars tend to be ethnocentric. You need to get beyond just what Americans think. And so I think one of the premier scholars on the planet in sociology is a man named Nicholas Luhmann, a German scholar, German sociologist, who actually was a lawyer turned sociologist. He said, you got to look at diversity. You got to look at issues of difference in societies and social systems, the meanings that people construct within those systems, the how they value consciousness, or what are the emphasis toward consciousness, race has to do with consciousness, and also how they communicate about these things. So these are all the different ways, and I don't have time to break it down to you, that you can analyze the context out of which we have CRT. The major sources, my granddaughter likes to come to me. She thought, she thinks that she's smarter than me. And so when I ask her, you think you're smarter than me? She said, I am right away. Because one of the questions she always asks me is, what's your source? What are your key sources? Well, if you want to go to CR, CRT, there are many sources, but some core sources, the one that I would recommend for seminary students, people in theology, the shortest and most punk, powerful that you can get to the issues quickly is by Delgado and Stefanik, Critical Race Theory, Third Edition. If you want a more extensive analysis, then Bridges work Critical Race Theory, a primer, which would list a bunch of articles that you can go to and dive in and really dig into the, the, the deep intricacies of the field. And then lastly, if you really like to look at all the articles across decades, then you would like to look at uh, one of the exemplars, Kimberly Crenshaw, Neil Gotana, uh, Peller, and Ke Kendall Thomas, Critical Race Theory, the key, key, uh, key writing. Now, what I have found is that I have read, uh, interacting with Dr. Sam Feimster, uh, a pun, uh, a plethora of articles, pop articles, usually uh, somewhat, what I would say, weak articles uh, that deal with the topic of uh, critical race theory. You, Pro, they're either for it or they're against it, or they don't know what's going on. And so we have those kind of issues to deal with. At a minimum, if we're going to tackle the issue of critical race theory, we should be concerned about what are the history or the conditions under which this idea or this idea system emerged. We should be concerned about the core concepts, the basic assumptions. We should be concerned about the exemplars, the proponents of the idea. Where do they come from? What is their biography? We should be concerned about the contributors, the contributions, the implications of these ideas. And in our society at this point, we should be concerned about how people respond to the controversies. What are the misinformation? What is possible misunderstanding? Lastly, I I've been studying the book of Proverbs for the last year and a half, verse by verse. Proverbs 16.2 16, says that the Lord 
evaluates motives. All the ways of human beings seem right to them, but the Lord looks at motives. So what are some motives behind this controversy? Possible motives, moral panic, ideological facade. People have a particular ideology and they're trying to get their point across without necessarily looking at the full picture or an accurate picture. And then lastly, I'm a fan of Daniel. All my life, I have been strongly influenced by the book of Daniel. In verse 12, in chapter 12, verse 3, it says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the horizon. And those who lead the many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. So there's the vertical, our relationship with God, but there's also leading many to righteousness. There's the horizontal. Both of those factors are key for a Christian. And like I said, you know, I love my little granddaughter. I love all my grandchildren. But I'm doing this not because I need another webinar, not because I need another publication, but that what happens to future generations in this country and in this world is what is at stake. And I'm fighting this fight for them. So what do we learn about CRT? Critical race theory was an awakening in legal studies stimulated by Dr. Derrick Bell's life journey from Harvard, where he became disenchanted over the slowness of civil rights legislation, uh, the law not working and, and really changing some of the major aspects of our society. So he became disenchanted. He, he left Harvard, went to Pittsburgh, and he started thinking, uh, writing articles that have evolved into what we call critical race theory, race theory. But let me say, that's decades after sociologists have studied it. In 1899, W.E.B. Du Bois published his Philadelphia Negro. There have been sociologists since the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in the 18th century, that be a 19th century, excuse me, that wrote about issues of race and scholarship and issues of history or whatever. So uh, in my opinion, as a sociologist, the lawyers came to it very late, you know, almost seven decades after we have been studying the same thing. And we commend the lawyers because they're taking a lot of the heat that we sociologists like to take, I mean, I mean used to take. But the idea is that these are not new ideas. So what is the central thrust of critical race theory? It basically argues or posits that race is central to understanding U.S. law and policy. There's a myth that goes around that the United States was founded on liberty. That's partially true. The United States was also founded on slavery years before the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Slavery was the reality here. So it's not always a bowl of cherries. The United States truthfully has a legacy of slavery, has a legacy of oppression and so forth. And that has shaped its law, its constitution, three-fifths African-Americans being three-fifths of a person. It shaped its constitution. It shaped its state formation. In other words, every aspect of the United States has been influenced by race. And that is a, a fact that uh, critical race theory and sociology and history teaches. Uh, the focus is on structures. Structures are just a fancy way of saying patterns. What's the pattern? What's the institutional pattern? What is the pattern of ideas? What the pattern of worship, of liturgy? The, look, for example, the Star Spangled Banner. There's been a lot of controversy over that. Did African Americans vote on that being the national anthem? Did a lot of other people who are part of the American experiment vote on that? No, it was a tradition passed down from circumstances that were more racist into us generation after generation. And yet there are people who will kill you, fight over something that obviously was influenced by the racist past. So CRT says, let's focus on the structures, the thinking, the ramifications that facilitate racism, its repercussions, and let's go beyond how you feel, whether you're comfortable. It's beyond your interpersonal or your interactions, or I like a black person, or I have a black friend, or I have an Asian friend. No, these are structural institutional issues, and you have to grow up. You know, Paul says when you acted as a child, you thought as a child, well, 
it's time to grow up in our society and think about the reality of the past legacy that has been passed down. So why does CRT emerge? I think of CRT as a volcano. All this stuff that I'm going to talk about, contextual factors, boiling around, and eventually there's an eruption, an intellectual eruption. Why did it emerge? Because of implicit biases against the full dimensions of truth and diverse human experiences. It wasn't as inclusive as it could possibly have been. Uh, tre tremendous ignorance of law professors. Now, I've studied even the, the former dean of Harvard University. I read his book about higher education. And I was amazed at the lack of sophistication when it comes to sociology and history. So there are a lot of lawyers that they may be good at law, which is process and implementation and policy, but they don't understand that the society gives birth to the law. It's only recently that CRT has said, but the law has to look at what happens in the society. So uh, it seems to me there are a whole generation of uninformed, unprepared legal scholars because they weren't looking at it from a diverse point of view, but from a, a point of view face or tainted by racism. Let's see, I still hope I have some time. Uh, white backlash over social progress. Some of us are old enough to realize the big hubbub over rape, reverse discrimination or anti-affirmative action. I did my master's paper on affirmative action. And what I found, what I found amazing, all this hype about reverse discrimination over uh, minorities in medical school. And here it is, what, 30, 40 years later, now we don't have enough uh, African-American male doctors or enough African-American doctors to deal with the pandemic. Uh, it, it, it amazes me that the hyper stupidity of that age has led to the kinds of struggles that we have now. Demographic changes, not recognizing them, not dealing with diversity. Conservative politics, well, uh, conservative ideology, Nixon's Southern strategy, Reagan's welfare queen, uh, Willie Horton ads, all kind of symbolic racism as William Sears at UCLA wrote about for many years. Supreme Court setbacks. There are consequences. Those uh, uh, actions and ideas have led to consequences. Uh, conservative jur uh, jurisprudence against busing, uh, metropolitan school desegregation, urban blight, urban renewal, urban segregation. Also, for example, you have a book that I gave a lecture on at the University of Rochester uh, by uh, Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton. It was called American Apartheid that they published in 1993. That book used the term hypersegregation. In some cases, schools and neighborhoods were more segregated in 1993 than they were at the birth of the civil rights movement. So you also have this validated by a PBS documentary, American Denial, saying uh, that, and that was published maybe five, six years ago, that Americans are in a, a, a denial about race. Remember, some of you are old enough to remember uh, Gunnar Murdahl's American Dilemma, a multi-volume set about the, the difference between creed and deed as it relates to race in, in the United States. So critical race theory really is just an, a, 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 an extension of that kind of analysis within the legal context. But there are other issues. We have all kinds of movies. We have all kinds of memes that, that, uh, that have racist stereotypes, uh, uh, media images, uh, right-wing stupidity, call it for what it is. A lot of right-wing thinking is primitive. Uh, we have now, as I taught in my classes, uh, the extension of what I call hate capitalism, social media now being used in that particular way. So time is going. I wish I could unpack these ideas in much more rigorous form, but let me just mention some other contextual stimuli. The war on drugs, a disproportionate criminalization for Blacks, uh, and very weak leadership in the church. As a sociologist, I could say overwhelmingly, so much of the church's emphasis is on interpersonal issues, not institutional, not organizational issues. Uh, so much of the church until recently has been uh, ignoring issues of justice, neglecting issues of justice. And it created a vacuum. And as I said, and I've talked to different seminaries, Bethel Seminary and so forth, it tends to be a devoid of a, 
a theology of systems, a theology of institutionalization and so forth. Uh, economic fears and fluctuations throughout the year. People get scared. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about unemployment and inflation. There are all kinds of moral panics. I remember teaching about uh, secular humanism being the big bugaboo in the 1980s. In fact, the, ti the title, A Friend for Opportunity, actually came uh, from that particular class that I used. Uh, all kinds of behavioral uh, cascades, people taking a small issue and magnifying it like crazy, and that led to Tea Party and Trumpism and so forth. And of course, there's a whole legacy of microaggressions against minorities, black fatigue, uh, always on being on, uh, police violence, police shootings. There are a whole bunch of factors that have contributed to CRT. So what does the paradigm teach? Well, we've got to move beyond gradualism. One day, we will have liberty and freedom and justice for all. One day, it reminds me of Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, that those pastors at that time said, you're going too fast, Martin. You're too radical. You need to slow it down. Well, uh, you know, just like Oliver Wendell Holmes said, justice delayed is often justice denied. And what CRT wants to do is move beyond this incremental, slow, we're going to postpone it generation after generation after generation and engage a whole array of legal constituencies from the LGBTQ community to the Muslim community, to people who are left out, as well as the racial and ethnic minorities, uh, questioning the issues of, of legality and, and using transformational scholarship and activism, and you can find this if you read Delgado's book. Enlightenment rationalism, everything is not, uh, cannot fit into enlightenment rationalism as many uh, disciplines have seen over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, questions liberal assumptions about social policy and social order. Questions the idea of equality theory. Is it really possible for those policies to lead to real equality? Questions legally reasoning. And, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. A law professor, D Jody David Armour, who teaches at uh, USC, has written several books that expose that, that, that there's no neutral principles in constitutional and other areas of law. So, exemplars, you probably have heard me say Derek Bell, Richard Delgado, Kimberly Crenshaw. Some of you may be familiar with Paul Butler on MSNBC. And Lonnie Guarnier is another name that is, but there are many, many others beyond these exemplars. Also, you may be uh, familiar with critical legal studies that deals with the whole issue of how the law is either determinate or indeterminate. Uh, radical feminism emphasizes patriarchy. Postmodernism, Foucault, Derrida, and other scholars. Radical African-American, Latinx, and other uh, people who emphasize black power, Chicano power or Native American power, indigenous peoples movements, and so forth. Ethnic studies that emphasizes group, the uniqueness of group experiences, and of course, activism, which is concerned with remedying injustice. CRT has been diffused across many academic disciplines and nations, and here's a key component or proponent or assumption. It rejects the popular notion of colorblindness. As a Christian, I find that to be an insult. If you can't see color, then something is wrong with the way you've been designed because God made everything colorful. And if you say you don't see color, that means you don't recognize the beauty of color. And so this idea of color blindness is ridiculous. It's a, it's a facade because racism is embedded in ordinary institutionalized society. We call them Karens and Kins now. Uh, people, you go bird watching at, New, at Central Park and have some woman come up to you and, and, and say that you're threatening them with when well, it's the opposite that's going on. Uh, it's indirect or direct effects of racism are typically not acknowledged. And it can make dominant groups uncomfortable. I hear this term all the time, I'm uncomfortable when we talk about race. Well, think about how uncomfortable people who had to live with centuries or decades of race, prejudice, and discrimination affected their lives and their family, their job opportunity. If you're uncomfortable for talking, look at the radioactive effects that it's had on real people 
in their situations on incarnated situations over time. So CRT recognizes that racism facilitates dominant so-called white interests. Now, scientifically, we know that there's no such thing as whiteness. And whenever somebody says, I'm white, that shows me that they are ensconced in racism because whiteness does not exist. But the symbol of whiteness is connected with power, prestige, wealth, and opportunity. So whiteness is a symbol of the status quo in power, status, wealth, opportunities, white supremacy, and racialization. Whenever you think that whiteness is the most beautiful, white music is the best music, white standards is the best standards, that's, that's racist. And so those are the issues that we're dealing with at CRT. Race is not biological. It is what we in sociology say, and they have borrowed our term, socially constructed in human minds in their imagination. The feelings and the meanings associated with race are learned and taught. Other distinctives of CRT, intersectionality. People have multiple inter intersecting, overlapping identities, contingencies, different social capital, different social intelligence, anti-essentialism. People have unique narratives, unique experiences. It must move beyond just black and white. Yes, the black and white may be the deepest, the longest, but there are other issues of oppression and injustice affecting other groups also. And then criticality. I have a document at the end that talks about crit critical thinking and what's involved in critical thinking. But CRT is not afraid to tackle the difficult issues, the issues that cause people to be silent, the issues that people don't want to engage the structural injustices. And you can read about it, a very excellent chapter in Delgado in chapter two. You know, we are told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 to 21, to prove all things, to hold fast what is good and to reject and move away from what's evil. The, the word there, documazo, is the same sort of word that you have in Romans 12, one and two, where it says to prove what is the acceptable will of God what is good, acceptable, and perfect, and so forth. So the idea here is that there is inherent conflict or enduring intergenerational consequences related to the past of institutionalized injustice, institutionalized inequality, and institutionalized oppression. Now, for some people in CRT, they see Marxism as, a, as, as the solution to, the, to what the, the, the issues of CRT. I think most sociologists and most people who uh, think scientifically are not persuaded by that argument, but I understand why people have it. Marx talked about uh, uh, challenging injustice, the injustice of so social class or class stratification, and people find that appealing. CRT does not capture all the intricacies and pathology of racism. Uh, to, for sociologists, it's kind of the generic aisle. Uh, so we, we're not all that impressed with it, but it does expose issues related to criminality and historicity that have not been dealt with. I think of uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, as a classic example. I've already mentioned Jody David uh, Armour's book. And then uh, some of you may be aware of a Adam Cohen's book, Supreme Inequality, how the, how the, how the, how the Supreme Court has contributed to these issues. Uh, I think of Plessy versus Ferguson. I think of Dred Scott. There's been no compensation for the mess that were that was created by those uh, those uh, uh, cases. So American lies, ideologies, and mythologies are assessed with critical acumen in order to discern and decipher the real truth, what's authentic. And I realize I hear that these little town meetings and school board meetings. Yes, some people can't handle the truth. That was true in Jesus' time. Uh, remember, he said his disciples are two by two. He says, go into the village. If your peace comes back to you, abide there. But if you go into a village and your peace does not abide there, shake the dust off your feet and move to another village. There are some people, even in his time, even with the Messiah right in front of them, reject the truth and couldn't handle the truth. So I'm not surprised that we see that in our society. 
Those who fear or misunderstand CRT unwittingly champion a conundrum of ignorance, deception, and indolence, whether they do it intentionally or not. Remember, Paul said, I thought as a child, but when I became a man or when I became a woman, if you would, I put away childish things. It's time for the United States, as we move toward a more diverse society, to put away childish things. The hype about the past is not the truth. And let me say one other thing as a, as a professor. A CRT, cognitive development and maturity is necessary to understand CRT. You're not going to have, you can't have, in many cases, even college students have difficulty understanding it. So the idea that it's going to take over public education is just, it's, it's a misnomer. It's a bugaboo, if you will. So what are some of the motives I see? Well, there are some people who like lies. And unfortunately, they haven't read John 8, 44, which says categorically that Satan, Hasatan, is the father of lies. So if you are indulging in lies and you are promulgating lies, it's not from the Lord. Uh, culpability. Some people come from traditions where they were slave masters. They owned plantations. They did own black people and other minorities and subordinated them and so forth. So they did, they, that, that was injustice. It was not a clear slate uh, where it says in Leviticus, you should be partial to the great or the small, to the rich or the poor. You should have the same standard for everybody. Some people are complicit. They didn't directly be involved in those kinds of oppression, but they benefited from it. They looked the other way like the Amalekites and some people benefit from racialization. Uh, there's criminality involved, righteousness, exhausted nation, sin is a reproach to any nation. There's covetousness, their love of money, not having it. The love of money is the root of all evil. People profit from the status quo, from the way things are, the housing uh, uh, segregation, the school oppression. And then lastly, you have leaders, unfortunately, in our uh, government that engage in sophistry that engage in corruption. And if you can't see that, then we're from different planets. I could go through all these verses. I went through some of them, but I would go to Proverbs 28, which says that the wicked want to cover up their sin. They will not prosper. The nation that tries to cover up its sin, it will not prosper. So look at Proverbs 28, if you will. Let me, I'm trying to hustle up. Forgive me, Jeff, I'm taking your time. CRT. Imagines or examines neglected narratives and stories and interpretations because stories matter. Why? Stories are, are part of people's identity. Stories are part of the incarnation of us entering the world. So stories do matter. CRT Tiger targets the continuing consequences and ramifications of racism. It's not over. It's like radiation. Radiation is around for 3,000 years. Uh, the explosions of racism in the past affect us now. It accentuates diverse, uh, divergent racial experiences. There's more than black and white. There's a whole rainbow of issues to deal with. It reveals the challenges embedded and biased conjecture. Just because you have a PhD or you have a position at a university doesn't mean that you know everything or that your analysis and your research is accurate. And then lastly, it accentuates voices that are silent microaggressions, hidden factors that affect people's lives. The question for us today, and I'm taking too much time, is CRT all wrong? If so, why is it all wrong? How is it on the wrong? All wrong? A, a scientist would ask, under what conditions? And who is responsible for addressing the issues, the wrongs, the grievances, the consequences exposed by CRT? Einstein was brilliant. Why? Because he said this. Problems cannot be solved with the same level of thinking in which they were created. And that's why he was such a brilliant scientist and his ideas continue to influence the entire world. So where are the better, more robust, or effective alternatives and solutions offered by so-called critics of CRT? If you, if you want to eliminate an inferior idea, then if you have a better idea, now is the time. Unfortunately, they tend to hide, but I don't see any better ideas. I'm trying to finish up as quickly as possible. Bear with me. We must combat truth decay 
Look at the RAND Corporation study about lies, misinformation, disinformation, distortion. It causes confusion of face, as the scripture talks about. We must have media literacy. Why? Because a seven-click, seven-second click culture is the, re the reality of the digital world. And it doesn't foster the critical thinking that we see in Proverbs, where it says, uh, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, the old King James. Intellect always matters, Proverbs 4, 7, which says wisdom is the principal or most important thing, therefore get wisdom. We need to realize that people retain 60 to 70% of the images in their in visual images in their conscious and subconscious mind. I know that from teaching, compared to only 30% from reading text. So those of us who are trying to maximize text, we have to be aware that we are engaging a visual world. When it comes to critical thinking, these are all the factors that are involved. I used to use that in my teaching. I don't have time to go through it. I've taken too much time. But let me say many thanks to my sponsors. Go out and pursue biblical justice, the golden rule. All the good you want others to do for you, do for them. But realize that any person, group, institution, system, or nation, and for any of them, there can be no authentic spiritual redemption apart from truth and justice. The Lord be with you. I feel like I need to lay down now. <laughs> Professor Allen has uh, once again laid out a pretty ambitious um, agenda for our reflection. And I am very grateful to be a part of uh, this series of presentations. My role here, however, is not so much as presenter as interlocutor or... Uh, shall we say, dialogue partner, and maybe uh, a little bit as gadfly here and there. My relationship to the issues that arise connected with CRT uh, come up for me in the context of my various uh, roles. Uh, firstly, in uh, serving at a seminary. Uh, both as dean and professor for some years, uh, serving as a pastor uh, for many years, and also just as a citizen of this country, CRT and the issues surrounding um, CRT are as important as any issues that I can think of for the life of the church and for us as citizens. And so it, for me, it's just a privilege to have an opportunity to reflect on these matters uh, together for, for a few weeks. I want, I want to begin my remarks by uh, just raising uh, certain features that I think are salient features in the context of this entire uh, conversation. And I'll, be, I'll begin by making a, a claim, and that claim is that the use of the word CRT is, is really functions as a label. Um, CRT, as most people recognize, is a very narrow uh, part of the legal uh, profession and academy that is a technical theory, the purpose of which is to explain certain phenomena in uh, the law and in our society. And that phenomenon is connected with why is it that so many people of color in the United States uh, suffer disparity relative to the white citizenry. And so it's precisely that disparity that needs to be explained. And white legal theory, I mean, I'm sorry, CRT legal theorists have done a very good job, I think, of showing how it is that racism, despite the advances 
uh, on the question of race in the United States through the 1960s? Why is it that these disparities continue uh, to dominate these communities? And CRT posits this thesis that racism is, is broad and systemic and inescapable, and as a consequence has led to, con to these continued disparities. Now that's, that's kind of the narrow um, field of CRT. And CRT then um, uh, basically represents technically that legal and academic conversation. However, CRT as we all know has emerged as a label in the popular culture, the media, uh, in church life to identify or point to a much wider range of issues that are all associated with race, but are not necessarily part of this more narrow legal and um, technical academic question. And so what I'm interested in and, and what I want to talk to um, Professor Allen about are features that he's already identified that are essential to or representative of aspects of critical race theory that I think are part of what makes this conversation for many people, and I mean by many people, primarily white people, uh, so uncomfortable. Why is it that, that there's so much consternation around a narrow or technical legal theory meant to explain disparity in American culture. So, so, so I'm gonna begin by just talking about a couple of notions and then in the context of those notions, uh, hopefully raise some questions uh, that I would like to uh, discuss or hear from Professor Allen. So uh, one of the first ideas that emerges in conversations around CRT that I think are, uh, well, it's clear that they're central to this, to this idea or these, this set of ideas, is the notion that the truth or knowledge or meaning is socially constructed. Uh, the notion of socially constructed knowledge or truth or meaning plays a, a central role in CRT narrowly and issues around CRT more broadly. And there's a history to why that's the case, a history that I think would be important to Dr. Allen, uh, namely uh, how it is that race is understood as a racial as I'm sorry, as a social construct. And so you have an entire body of philosophical and intellectual energy over the past 150 years that has tended to challenge the idea from the enlightenment that we can read off from the world what is true and what is meaningful. And as a consequence, of that enlightenment view of how it is that we arrive at the truth or arrive at meaning, uh, we have uh, elevated or privileged certain notions over time and we have constructed them on the basis of what we take to be already somehow in reality. So if your view of the truth or if your view of how our concepts and ideas are meaningful is that we get them from the world, they reflect how the world is, then when it comes time to, shall we say, make sense of our notions or our ideas of race, what are we going to do? We're going to look to the world and see how it is that we can account for the differences that exist in the world relative to race. Now, it just so happens that 
this concept, this notion of race becomes operative or becomes important or finds its way uh, to cultural significance at the very same time <laughs> that Western, uh, Western civilization, you might say, is making its way uh, into the rest of the world. It is, it's expanding, it's exploring. So Western exploration and our notion of race emerge about the same time, about the same time that colonialism becomes a, a, a political fact uh, in parts of the world, at the same time that the Atlantic slave trade emerges. Uh, the, the, the idea or the concept of race begins to be formulated and refined and understood in, in increasing depth. And behind that depth are ideas about how we understand the truth, how we gain knowledge, how it is that meaning happens. And so for those whose uh, interest is in making sense of race, they seek to do so by, shall we say, creating taxonomies of, 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 of human difference. And those taxonomies are emerge as early as the, as the 18th century, uh, when uh, botanists are trying to, to figure out how to differentiate human beings in terms of appearance and so forth. And so you have, as early as the 18th century, the idea of Americanus human beings and Africanus human beings and Asiaticus human beings and European human beings. So now we start cutting up the world in terms of a racial taxonomy according to certain physical features. And so this, so this notion of race is, is all of a sudden something that we can investigate in the world and then become clearer and clearer about the differences. Well, by the 19th century, you have what might be called the rise of scientific racism. So much so that scientists start measuring the skulls of human beings and using those results to draw conclusions about uh, superiority and inferiority between human difference or what they take to be human difference. Uh, policymakers are using genetic um, uh, taxonomies to make sense of inferiority and justify all kinds of, of social policies that are going to impact different groups of people. So for example, um, these policymakers look at who is and isn't inferior and use those statistics or those um, results to justify the, the removal of Indians in the um, Indian Removal Act of 1830. In other words, all of this so-called science uh, is informing our concept of race because we think that our ideas are properly understood and their truth is validated by an examination of the objective world. This is a this is a robust enlightenment concept. And of course, we know the horrors of the 20th century and eugenics and how eugenics were used to justify the whole scale destruction of groups of people based on what this science told us were um, features of inferiority and how those uh, features of inferiority could, if not stopped, literally uh, degrade and undermine uh, the human species over time. So all of these different uh, 
efforts are what we might call the modern approach to race or the modern understanding of race. Race is an objective dynamic that is discernible through observation and testing to which we can appeal to make sense of what is and is not superior and inferior within the human race. It just so happens that um, those assignments of uh, superiority and inferiority um, were provided by or constructed by uh, the very people whose interest it was to see that some were superior and others were inferior. In other words, we, we figured out how to grade uh, color as an indicator of inferiority or superiority. Now, it's precisely this supposition, this modern supposition of how meaning and truth and knowledge work that is called into question uh, with the rise of our ideas about history and how societies and communities and ideas are in themselves historical. It starts with Hegel, it moves to Marx, then you land with figures like Nietzsche, and then by the 20th century, you're engaged with figures like Husserl and Heidegger and Wittgenstein, which leads to further developments with critical theorists and uh, neo-Marxists, uh, and it goes on and on. The bottom line is, is that this intellectual development that we now tend to refer to as postmodern calls into question the idea that truth, meaning, and uh, knowledge can't, is just out there waiting for us to, quote, discover that the world or nature somehow just tells us what is and isn't real, that there's this correspondence between our concepts and reality, and it's that correspondence that we're trying to understand. No, no, these postmodern thinkers say. What they tell us is, is that what truth comes to and what knowledge comes to and what meaning comes to is given with the social interactions, the behavioral interactions, the, the, the basic uh, responses that are fundamentally human. And so that fundamental dimension of, of postmodern thinking essentially argues that that knowledge and truth and meaning are a social construct. It arises in the context of social realities. The point being is that racism now is understood and CRT trades on this notion very uh, clearly that racism or race, the notion of race is a social construct. And what's important in CRT and other inquiries like this is how is it that this construct has come to be? And so CRT and other interested parties want to examine the social circumstances within which race uh, is operative. And uh, we haven't talked about it yet and we will but this takes us to a place where those who have investigated the notion of social construction of race inevitably land on ideas like white privilege and white supremacy. Why do they do so? Because if you look at the dynamics within these social constructs, it's self-evident that those constructs privilege certain persons over against others, and that privileging is rooted in a notion of race. And that notion of race as a social construct functions to ensure that those who are in positions of prominence, privilege, security, et cetera, 
that those positions are can be and are maintained. And then you can trot out all the examples of how that's the case and look at the social construction that ensures that it's the case and then raise questions about how could things be otherwise such that those disparities do not follow from those that kind of racial disparity or that kind of social disparity that is evident as a function of race. And so my, all of that to say, and I know I've taken a little too long, but I wanna get to this question for Hank. And that is the tension between those who want to argue that it's a social construct, but also want to say it's not a mere construct. In other words, the social construction of race as an idea or a concept is certainly the case, but it's not just a mere construct. It does, shall we say, give us what we mean by racism and race. In other words, it's real. It influences people. It impacts laws. It changes societies. It marks the way people act and behave and think and think what is and isn't the case. Sure, we've moved away from kind of a biological essentialism where race is concerned, but to say that it's socially, uh, uh, that it's socially uh, contextualized isn't to say that it's less real. And so as a sociologist, how do you avoid the, the biological essentialism or the essentialism that certain forms of scientific inquiry lend or, or prejudice towards sometimes and remain equally objective and scientific in your sociological research with realities that we now acknowledge are social constructs. So that's the big question for Professor Hank. <laughs> and if I could just go a little further, Larry, and say one, raise one other question, then I'll shut up and everybody can jump in. <laughs> but then the next issue uh, brings us to the, to the tensions around white privilege and white supremacy that again are labels meant to uh, represent a whole range of ways in which endemic racism, let's call it that for the moment, endemic racism finds its way into our institutions, into our practices, into our perceptions, and is, as you say, not connected to our feelings or our relationships on an interpersonal level necessarily, but is what we call systemic. In other words, you find it in systems everywhere you look. And in looking at those systems, you see how the construct of racism is privileging some over others, advantaging some over others. And the interrogation of those uh, advantages and the constructs that serve them are the point of, shall we say, intellectual and spiritual seriousness. In other words, my brother or sister may not be doing as well as they might if things were otherwise. I have a responsibility to that as a Christian, and I have to interrogate the places where these disparities present themselves and um, the, uh, the old liberalism, the, the old ideas of equality, the old ideas of, and I'm sorry to say it, but the old ideas of, of rational inquiry are not the tools for the exa this examination. Um, the incrementalism you spoke of that is fostered by the old liberalism um, doesn't address directly enough the causes of the disparities that should trouble us as Christians because these are the marks of obvious injustice in our society. And so I'm asking you as a scientist and a sociologist how you maintain that balance on the one hand and on the other hand, speak into white uh, supremacy or the notions of, of 
of whiteness that that burden these contexts um, that are so important to us. So there, there you go. Very good. Let me um, just uh, mark where we are in our process um, right now. We are going to enter into a dialogue between our two presenters. Um, and uh, I think, uh, Jeff, you have raised uh, a question around the uh, origins of uh, the, the notion of race and uh, its social construction, uh, and uh, also a question around um, the uh, the power and, and presence, the kind of in the air presence of white supremacy uh, and privilege. Um, and you you two can refine that those two questions a little more. But we'll have a dialogue between our two speakers for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we will open it up to uh, further questions from our audience. And we, we certainly invite your questions um, at any time to come to our uh, through through the chat and you can send them to everyone so we can see them. Thank you. So Hank. Jeff, uh, I thank you. Thank you for your brilliant analysis. It was well done. Remember now, I was supposed to talk about CRT. There's a larger conversation about race, its origins or whatever that I did not bring up because the focus was on CRT. Let me say, you asked me how do I as a sociologist deal with it? There's a parallel situation in the natural science world. Let me sort of explain and I'll draw an analogy to what we're talking about with race. In the scientific world, at least the physical sciences, you have the Newtonian science, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and the predictions that are associated with that. Overturned or extended by Einstein with general relativity and special rel rel relativity, and then you have the world that blew Einstein's mind, the quantum world. I'm suggesting and what I'm working on now is a parallel in the way we think about race between visible, uh, easy to understand empirical issues, which I would call sort of like the Newtonian synthesis compared to Einstein with his general and special relativity, I would argue that there would be issues like scientific literacy that fall within that particular domain. But then you have the unpredictable world in which you have en entanglement and you have superposition and all these other issues in the quantum world that I think you have to have all three of these ways of thinking as it applies to issues of CRT and issues of race. Now, I spent the last four or five years of my life studying these issues and developing this parallel, but I have not yet finished writing that piece. That's the piece of the future. But I look at, uh, when I look at research, those are the three containers that I put all empirical research in. Is it a, in fact, there's an excellent book written by a philosopher. Uh, her name was Dana Zohar. And her husband is at, at uh, Oxford, uh, Ian Marshall. It's called the Quantum Society. It does what I just talked about. It talks about the problems of Newtonian science, uh, sort of Einsteinian science, and the new quantum world. And it tries to look at these social problems from each of those lenses. Now, let me back up and say, because we weren't talking about race per se, but we're talking about CRT, I go back to those, in, in fact, for the next session, those four issues that I see in your talk. Number one, the issue, how do you handle the notion of difference? How do you handle it visibly, which uh, a lot of race is based on phenotype, things that you can see. But there are a lot of things about human beings, genetic differentiation, you cannot see. So how do you handle this whole notion of difference at multiple levels? It just can't be based on what's being seen. The second issue is that there aren't very good models for social systems and the impact that various behaviors or notions can have in social systems. In sociology, since you brought it up, we talk about issues that relate to symbolic interaction, or we talk about issues that are related to social exchange, like our economics and political science colleagues or whatever. 
But I'm, I'm arguing that those are very primitive ways of thinking about these issues. And what you're challenging us to is to move to a deeper, much more robust, much more sophisticated understanding of those topics. And I agree. And that's why I think the synthesis is in the quantum, the way we understand quantum realities, quantum computing, quantum manifestations. That's, or, or to use string theory, super string theory, multiverse, in theory. There's a whole bunch of theories that apply to natural phenomena that we don't ask questions as it relates to social or interactional kind of phenomena. So I'm working on that. Believe me, I hope I live long enough to finish that piece for you. But I hear your question, and it, it's coming back to you, brother. But give me a little bit more time to work on just that particular question. Now, you raised some other issues that I agree. Meaning issues, I saw that in your talk. The way we think epistemological issues, ontological issues, which philosophers talk about, I saw that, but that's beyond the scope of what I prepared for to engage in this particular webinar. My task in 20 minutes, and I probably took 30 or 35, in 20 minutes, I was supposed to give an overview of CRT and to try to integrate ideas from Christian faith as it relates to the debate about CRT. And so that's what I tried to do with this piece. And the second, we're going to talk about intersectionality. I have some issues about that will flush this out there. And then in the third segment, I have some plans to tackle some of these issues that you raised, but I don't want to tip my hand to give everything out at, at, at this one time. But I thank you for refreshing remarks. We do have to get into the philosophy of things if we're going to be very uh, serious about this. But uh, my task, at, at least at this juncture, was just to talk about CRT. And as a sociologist, there are many levels. If you think of, a, if you think of thinking as a, a 10-floor apartment, uh, for sociology, we would say we're probably at the eighth floor. For CRT, we see them at the sixth floor or the fifth floor. So there's a lot more that needs to be developed before we can uh, really engage in the and the and fulfilling some of the questions that you asked. Thank you. Those are good questions. Please send them to me. I want to. I want you to send me those questions. So so let me bring this down to uh, a very. Um, basic level of, of appreciation and concern that arises in the life of the church. And, 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 it, and it looks kind of like this, if I'm understanding you correctly, that historically we have read the concept of race. We've read, we, we've read the Bible through a lens uh, called race that is suited to a Newtonian world. But now we've learned a little more. And having learned a little more, we're trying to come to terms in the context of our life together in the church with the implications of our new horizon so if our new horizon is quantum but our old ways of reading are newtonian then the question is how is it in the life of the church and i'm sure we're going to get to this in the course of our conversation but how do we how do we foster quantum readings of the scriptures how do we preach quantum sermons how do we uh and because there are lots of ways that the question of race um, impacts people and you can tell it's important to them for good or ill because of how it animates people you mess with their fundamental notions of race and they become far more motivated for good and evil uh, than they do around even more seemingly fundamental issues. Let's say, you know, how does God save us? Nobody's, nobody's having a, nobody's going to a school board meeting 
because they think teachers may be seeing things about God or, or about some other things that are fundamental to our faith. Um, no, they're, they're going because they're jacked up about this notion of race and what we say about it in relationship to justice. So, so, the, so the question for me then for our seminar, for what we're doing here together is how does, how does a quantum understanding that we are alleging is what we know impacting our concept of race and how to read race as a filter for our understanding. Because race is a reality that's not going away. Why is it not going away? Because race is real, but not real in the way we used to think, not Newtonian real, it's quantum real. So how do we get that real up and running in our own congregations, in our own communities. So I'm gonna leave that there. Can't hear you. He doesn't mute, Hank. Can't unmute it. Yvonne, can you help it, uh, Hank unmute, please? Uh, Yvonne, are you there? Can you help Hank unmute, please? Yes, I certainly can. Sorry about that, Hank. <laughs> yeah, just leave uh, him and Jeff and me unmuted, if you would, please. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I did. I did not mute, mute him back. I didn't think so. I'm sorry about that. Let's let's see. There we go. There you. Are you? <laughs> All right. There you go. Jeff, uh, the way we understand God. Have you heard, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I am that I am, who was, who is, and who is to come. That's quantum thinking. Being, same being at different aspects of what we call time. So God has given us a quantum signature. And the Israelis and Jewish scholars are working on this notion of how it relates to the Old Testament. What I argue is that we are in a scientific, or we're in a revolution in the way we think about the church. Should the Lord allow us to live? The way we think about things in the church are going to change. There's a book that's written by a guy named Mario Livio. He's a mathematician, mathematician, physicist. He wrote a book called Galileo and the science denier. And he goes back and looks at the history of the Catholic Church and how they reacted to Galileo and Copernicus and their ideas. Of course, they were, you know, given to the Inquisition. They were hailed as, uh, you know, heretics and so forth. And yet, as time has gone on, century after century, the ideas that they talked about are pretty much not questioned these days. So I'm arguing that our ideas about race, our ideas about scripture, our ideas about the assembly, about the church, are going to change. They're going to change. If the Lord allows us to live, they're going to be very, very different from what we have been socialized with. I see quantum saying that God exists in realities that we have yet to understand. We don't even come close. Um, and I, for example, I think of my own, you know, I taught at Wheaton College for a while, Calvin. I always found these schools, uh, when I wanted to build my career, I thought about Acts 1A. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. That's quantum. That's not just one place, but multiple places at the same time. So I see that uh, what is about to unfold in our understanding of ecclesiology, of eschatology, of soteriology, all those things that the theologians have studied in the past, if the Lord tarries in this century, is going to go through a profound quantum change, a quantum understanding that will really make, make the way we thought about the church 
Newtonian. I mean, it, it, will, it will compare that old kind, rigorous, primitive way of thinking and uh, make it somewhat obsolete. That is, we still have enough time. We are, <laughs> what is it? We are, we're in the process, but we're not there yet. We're in this sort of indeterminate period, but I think we need new voices. And, and, and be, let's be honest, what's happening here is one step in that direction. The questions that you're raising, the issue of justice, it's a recalibrating, it's not throwing out the old ideas of the church, the old orthodoxy, but it's making them better than they've ever been before. Okay, I'm gonna step in uh, at this time uh, and uh, help us move to questions from um, the uh, participants are with us today, our audience, and I would like to uh, begin, and we continue to invite you to share uh, through the chat feature questions that you have. Um, here is a, a question I'd like to uh, ask, and that is, uh, what actions can churches take to advance a CRT? I guess in either sense that uh, Dr. Willits is talking about, either the narrow legal sense or the broader um, symbolic inclusive sense. What it, uh, actions can churches take to advance CRT, especially among skeptics in congregations? I think that um, any uh, church that hopes to um, make headway in understanding the implications of um, CRT for their community um, must do so by contrasting um, the tendency to believe that racial disharmony or racial disparity is fundamentally and ultimately a question of my own personal feelings or my own or people or individual attitudes. Um, I think it, I think we have to begin to uh, give examples of how it is that uh, racism, i.e. white privilege, i.e white supremacy, i.e. whiteness, um, these, this, this, this range of terminology is alien to many of our congregations. And we have to work at introducing this terminology in ways that are, that, that allow our parishioners to ask questions, uh, but doesn't but doesn't spend its time trying to always justify its application. And in other words, you can explain it, but you don't need to work, but so hard to justify it. And, and what I mean by that is let's go back to Dr. Allen's metaphor. Um, if you walk into a first year physics class, the professor will chart for you the history of the development of science, the conclusion of which will be to arrive at an understanding that quantum physics and other developments are where we are. And I think in a similar way, pastors and church leaders um, can chart the development of the concept of race and draw our attention to its impacts, celebrate developments that are in the right direction, and show how we can make further developments by the application of notions that hitherto have not been applied. And if those notions make you personally uncomfortable, then let that become the basis of a further conversation about why you're uncomfortable. Yeah. And you go slow and you do it patiently and lovingly, but you might ask, 
Why does that make you uncomfortable? Well, it sounds like you're saying this. In other words, it sounds like you're saying, we don't know if it's a particle or a wave. That's because we don't. In other words, you know, to use the analogy, um, it sounds like you're saying that I'm a racist. Well, you may not be a racist in how you feel, yeah. but there's, but if you shift the, if you shift the, um, the frame a little bit, you may see that many of the ways in which you go about your daily life, or, or you may see that laws that you and your family have benefited from, or you may see that how it is that you have had generational wealth and your family hasn't had generational wealth impacts your opportunities, your advantages, your privileges. And these are things that we've underappreciated, but they have impact. And that impact is what we call racism. Very good. Uh, uh, Dr. Allen. Um, I would just say, can you hear me? I would just yes. say that what Jeff said is correct in the sense that we have, our country is going through a phase transition, a situation in which European ideas or, or white Anglo, white supremacist ideas dominated. Well, now the mix is changing. We're in phase two. And how do we accommodate that phase two? Now, if I am uh, talking about churches, I need to know where they are. There are some churches that are still stuck in the old, uh, and we'll talk about this next week, in what we would say reactionary. Uh, they still want to be stuck in the way it used to be, the, uh, the way America used to be, the way the church used to be. They're going to need different interventions than another church that understands multicultural world, understands differentiation, understands international impact, has international networks or whatever. That's a very different kind of intervention for that church that you're going to have for the church that's still sort of reactivist. And then there are a number of different uh, stages in between that churches will, depending on the pastor, depending on the denomination, depending on the leadership, and the interventions ought to be designed based on careful research as to where the church is. Not everybody's at the same level of cognitive development. Not every church has the same level of professionalization or different occupations and so forth. Without knowing that, I can't give you a one prescription fits all. But I can say, having taught at Wheaton College, that most of my life I was incredibly bored by what I saw about the church because there's a significant gap between the way things are happening outside the church and the way things are happening in the church. You know, we're, some research indicates that young people are falling away, especially from the conservative evangelical church, falling away. Why? Because the multicultural, diverse world that they're facing is very, very different than the tried and true things that have been taught based on the past. So it seems to me this is a time. I mentioned uh, Livio's book, uh, um, uh, Galileo and the Science Den Deniers. If I were in charge, if you allow me as an outsider, I don't want to be a minister or whatever, I would say, let's read that book together and ask, what does that mean for the church? Remember, the church blew it at the Copernican Revolution. The church blew it at a lot of these scientific revolutions. How can we change the narrative? Not being overcome by evil, but let's overcome evil or difference or meaning or something with good. What can we do that's positive instead of always being afraid of something or, or, or want to move away from something? What can we contribute? What can we, can we contribute to the CRT debate instead of wanting to run away from it? That's the way I would approach it. They'd probably throw me out of the church, but hey, you need profits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move to another question. Um, uh, is race an issue in the church and is racism real in the church? Um, what does the Bible say about uh, justice and uh, how do people respond when uh, truth is spoken to power? So uh, we'll go back to... Uh, 
I guess either one of you can pick it up. Try to keep it to about two minutes each uh, so we can get to some more questions that are coming in. Thank you. Well, like most, um, most human sin, um, if you go to church, you're going to find uh, human sin because there are human beings in the building. And racism is a form of sin that is certainly prevalent uh, in our society, and it would be odd, bizarre, uh, to imagine that it were not in the church. And so I think, I think that uh, dealing with racism in the context of the church is akin to dealing with many other sins, and it's important to recognize that sin isn't always interpersonal. Uh, sin has dimensions that go well beyond our interpersonal relationships. Um, theologians and sensitive readers of the Bible recognize uh, moral sin. They recognize um, uh, sin more generally. And so we have to be able to speak into our congregations an awareness of the different ways in which sin is present in the world. And so I, I think we have to begin by just acknowledging its presence and, and how it is that, that uh, race uh, and racism is inescapable as a social reality of which we all participate. And I might ask uh, Hank then, how, how does that building of awareness relate to justice and speaking truth to power in churches? Well, I taught uh, Sunday school at my uh, former church for 17 consecutive years. Because being a sociologist, there's a lot in the Old Testament and there's a lot in the New Testament that relates to issues of race, stratification, uh, misogyny. And, and unfortunately uh, for a lot of teachers, they don't make those connections. Uh, they don't integrate the teachings of the church with the realities of the issues that people face today. And so, you know, I think of my, but you had my good colleague, Willie Jennings, one of my old friends uh, in, and he talked about uh, justice and theological education. Well, he wrote a book, The Christian Imagination, that goes back centuries and talked about the issue of race as it relates to the church and the church's imagination, that's something that's new. You have uh, probably my old friend, Anthea Butler, who wrote a book about uh, racism and evangelicalism. And you have uh, uh, this uh, 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 colleague at Calvin, who's written about misogyny and its impact in the church or whatever. So there are people writing that. I don't feel that my calling is I deal with scientific issues. A lot of these, what I call pop culture issues, everyday ordinary issues or whatever, I'm capable of dealing with those as a sociologist, having taught at the Christian colleges and seminaries and whatever. But there's a level above where most parishioners are. And it seems to me that you, you have to have a division of labor. You have to have people who are working at these levels, high level. You have to have people who are working in, in, in the church uh, with people in the church, people working in Christian schools, and so forth. And so it's going to take what we're going to be talking about next uh, in the next webinar, intersectionality. I've got some ideas about how we can move forward with these things. And also I have some ideas for the third webinar where we talk about, I don't want to give away everything today, put it that way. So <laughs> I'll just stop now. All right. Larry, okay. may I also yeah. add that, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to foster a conversation in your congregation uh, in, a, in a setting where you can have, you know, dialogue. It, it, it's helpful sometimes to, to note for your congregation that the earliest conflict in the Christian church was an issue over race. In other words, can Gentiles be Jews? Can Gentiles join the family? Can Gentiles be included? Can they be full participants?
Good. And then, you know, there, there's an array of, of, of examples in scripture, but the earliest conflict in the church theologically was racial. Yes. Can they belong? Very good. Thank you. Um, there is a, a, a question um, about uh, some folks in the church who are, you might call the saints, I suppose, in, in yes. conversations that the back benches. do not seem to have a racist bone in their bodies. I mean, they really are just open hearted, wholly generous, embracing people of all, all kinds of people. But how do we help those folks? who um, really are pretty pretty inclusive and embracing and, and try to bring equity to everyone they meet at a personal level, how do we help those folks see that they live in a culture of whiteness, that they live in a culture that, um, and in a, a institutions that um, are kind of preloaded with white privilege and, and white uh, power? I think that um, the... The, the first move in, in that effort is to acknowledge who they are. And by that, you say, you are open, you are welcoming, you are ready to receive anyone. And that's precisely what God wants in us. However, precisely because of our openness and welcoming uh, spirit, we have to puzzle over why our wider society seems to reflect these rather uh, ev self-evident disparities between groups of people. So why is it my friend who is, shall we say, African-American uh, and part of my church family is my brother or sister, why is that person's path in this world so different than mine. Well, what do you mean? And then you can go down and just give examples, whether they apply to that person or not, and that they see that, well, there are, there, there are um, unacknowledged disparities. Churches don't talk about these deep disparities very often. They don't articulate them. They don't rehearse them. They don't say, let's not look at our immediate relationship to God or my immediate interpersonal relationship, but let's look at my relationship to my society as if that somehow is off limits Christianly. No, it, it ought to, and then you can point to the prophets and say, look how concerned they were for the people around them. Okay, so if we are concerned and if our spirits are open, it has to wonder and even be burdened by the fact that these disparities seem to exist and exist for certain people. And when we ask the question why, then we can draw direct and dotted lines to our own participation in the institutions and arrangements and legal, um, uh, legal statutes that have a bearing on why those uh, disparities exist. And so it's just it's just drawing one more line. There's the line between me and God, and there's the line between me and my brother, but there's also the line or the circle between me and the society in which I live. And that seems to be the conversation we have not had enough of. Thank you. Anything to add, um, Dr. Allen? I would just suggest that if I... Um, could find the right congregation. I would have a Sunday school class or quarterly seminar on CRT of the Bible. Okay, let's let's go through the Old Testament. Let's go through the New Testament and see if there are any ideas in those documents before CRT was created that relate to the kinds of issues that CRT people are dealing with. For example, I would say there's no idea system created by human beings that's perfect. There are always going to be limitations. There are always going to be gaps. But somewhere I read that we are to be people who don't are not overcome by evil, but that we overcome evil with good. So if you have a better idea than CRT in the church, let's see it. 
if you've got a better idea for dealing with the complexity that's talked about in CRT, let's see it. I think people are persuaded by the demonstration, the full demonstration, the mature demonstration of the gospel, not just weak propositions, not just weak talk, not just Sunday morning uh, quarterbacking, if you will, but instead of running away, what are you afraid of? If you have the Lord of glory inside of you, what are you afraid of to talk about the kind of issues raised by CRT? What made the Lord great? He was not afraid of the publicans. He was not afraid of the Pharisees. He was not afraid of the prostitutes. He was not afraid of the lepers. He was not afraid of people who the religious elite did not want to engage. He engaged them. That's why they loved him. And if our church is ever going to be a place where everybody loves, it's going to have to change the way it does business. And instead of running away from these issues, tackles them with love, with empathy head on. Thank you. I'm going to share one more question and, and give an example of it by linking in uh, another question. And the question is this, um, what do we do until that quantum change in our thinking that you've talked about, uh, Dr. Allen, what do we do um, before that fully takes place in the meantime uh, to deliver us from the injustice of, of racism in all its forms? Um, and might the church's involvement in the truth and reconciliation movement be an example of, of something we could do? But what do we do in the meantime before our thinking fully changes? I'll, I'll begin with you, Hank, and then ask Jeff to. Well, I mean, I'm a sociologist. For me, uh, the verse, I think it's in Proverbs 23 that says, as a man or woman thinks in their heart, so are they. To me, if you have messed up thinking, nothing else matters. And so for me, uh, we have to have a, an intellectual side. Now, it's not just intellect. There's behaviors. There's emotions. I mean, the full range of the spiritual gifts from prophecy, teaching, exhortation, the full range of those gifts need to be talked about and implemented. But I would argue that, hey, forgive me, don't throw stones at me, but through the Zoom, but the church has messed up thinking in so many of these areas. So yes, and the truth and reconciliation, yes. Let's join those people who make us uncomfortable. Maybe they have something to say to us and maybe they can help us change and move toward this quantum model of understanding. I hope and pray that that's the case. Thank you so much, Larry, uh, Sam, uh, for moving us in this direction. We can't, there's no place else where we can have this kind of conversation. And yet you have to, my, my, grand, my daughter gave me a little plaque. It says the, what is it? The, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. If we don't take the first step, we can't take the second step, the third step. So if we're going to move to a more sophisticated understanding, let this be the step that moves us in that direction. Thank you very much, Hank. I'm gonna have to leave it there uh, and we will uh, pick up uh, next time with uh, further inquiries. I do want now to uh, thank both of our speakers and uh, invite you to, uh, to share your thanks uh, just by acknowledgement or an emoji, whatever you would like. Uh, and I wanna pass uh, this on now to uh, the uh, Reverend Dr. Sam Feimster uh, with the IJF to tell you about what we're gonna be doing with some of these conversations and then he'll pass it on to uh, um, Sean Roberts with um, MACBF. So, uh, Sam. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, and to everyone. Uh, thank you for sharing this time with your sisters and brothers. Uh, if you had a chance to see the gallery view, uh, we were 55 strong at points in time this morning, sisters and brothers. This is a family affair. We're naming our hurt. Uh, we're naming the ways that we have been uh, deformed uh, by misinformation and therefore ways that we have hurt and continue to hurt one another. And then we're moving towards healing. We're asking God uh, to heal us as a family. 
When I was a child at my Episcopal Baptist church, uh, the deacons used to get up after the pastor preached and they would say, now is the time everybody can be involved. And I used to wonder about that statement about why they, you know, were we not involved in the preaching, you know, but we're not saying amen. But as I matured, I began to understand that, that what they were saying is now is time for you to be involved, for the audience to be involved. We've had some wonderful presentations. I, I, I anticipate that the other two series will be equally as robust. And so what I invite you to do is to acknowledge that each of us are conduits of common revelation as we, uh, and, and so we ask that you will prepare uh, uh, to share with us just how you have been impacted by this series. On November 13th, which is the last day, uh, we will invite you to, to, to join us, uh, you know, for a time of, of meditation and then to, um, to, to, to share with us uh, on, a, on a survey document, a survey instrument, just how you have been impacted. Why do we need that? Uh, because as Hank mentioned, uh, he doesn't know it all. As smart as he is, Jeff doesn't know it all as much as he pushed me around. But we all have something to contribute. So we need to know from you. Uh, what you would like to hear, uh, what the next series should be, how we can continue to come together and serve one another. And so thank you so much for being with us. And I look forward uh, to reading uh, the information that you provide. Now is exactly the time when we can all participate. Thank you so much. And Sean will close us out this morning. Come on, Reverend Roberts. All right, I am thankful for the opportunity to be with you all in this conversation. This is an important conversation. It's a needed conversation. Not only am I the executive coordinator of the Mid-Atlantic Shepherd Baptist Fellowship, but I'm a local pastor. And as a pastor, I am glad that we can have and share these conversations. So thank you for being with us. I know that Saturday and time, morning is an important time, and I'm thankful that you have uh, taken the time to be with us in this deep, important conversation. I am just close us now with a word of prayer. Gracious, loving, and almighty God, for this time, thank you for the opportunity to go deeper, to hear the truth and speak the truth to learn and even seek the truth. Help us, Lord. Help us to love one another. Help us to have a deeper critical and how that relates to our brothers and sisters and how we can be your and love one another. Take and help it to grow, to grow in our mind, grow in our hearts, grow in our spirits can be better people in following in your way. We give you thanks for all you do in Jesus. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next Saturday.